Okay, reminder that we have an exam on Tuesday during lab period that's covering chapters 25, 26, and 27. There are worksheets, review worksheets for um, chapters 25 and 26. Um, I will do um, solutions for the problems on YouTube over the weekend. So that's there for you. And of course, I have to do the last one. The last one is what we learned in lab, right? That's all we learned from chapter 27. So that's what you're responsible for is basically what we learned in lab from chapter 27. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know that there's any specifics to say except for just to remind you that it's coming up and what the topics are. We'll review also in class on Monday a little to make sure that you're as prepared as can be to get those A's you all want, right? Okay, Ryan wants an A. Everyone else kind of groaning about it. He's he's serious. Okay, so we start with relativity on Wednesday, and we're continuing with relativity. So we went through Einstein's clock, right? And the last thing in class, the reason I didn't give you any problems was because I simply got to the relation that said the time for the clock to tick if you're standing outside watching the train go by is equal to the time that it took for the clock to tick. If you're inside divided by the square root of one minus V over C quantity squared. Now some abbreviations, you might've seen a famous picture of Einstein explaining his theory of special relativity. And he has this equation written as, beta instead of so it's pretty clear then that this has beta defined as v over c beta is a unitless speed if beta is one it's going to speed of light that's the maximum if beta is zero it's at rest so that's an easier way to deal with v over c v over c appears a lot in relativity so we often just say it's moving with speed beta equals 0.85. And that means it's moving with a speed of 0.85 times the speed of light. Another thing, I think this actually has a name that's called the Lorentz factor. This is used a lot in relativity problems. I usually calculate gamma before I even check to see if it's necessary because it seems like it always is. So with that definition, we have the most standard form, delta t is equal to delta t zero times gamma. And I ended the class period talking about the values gamma can take on. If speed is zero, that is if beta is zero, what is the value of gamma? A is zero, what's one over the square root of one minus zero? One. So gamma is one if something's at rest. Not zero, but one. Now as speed increases, what's going to happen to gamma? It's going to get smaller. The denominator is going to get smaller. But if you have one over something that's getting smaller, gamma itself oh, is getting bigger. So as speed increases, gamma increases until if you reach the speed of light, what is gamma if you reach the speed of light? One. What is one minus beta squared approaching if beta is approaching one? It's approaching one. Yeah. If beta is approaching one, then you're approaching one over zero, which is infinite. So gamma ranges from one to approaching infinity. As V approaches C, 
gamma approaches infinity. So it's important to know a little bit about that gamma because it shows up everywhere. Now coming back to just the outcome of this, what does it mean to say the clock tick is different as measured by somebody inside the cart versus somebody who's standing outside on the earth? What does that mean? It means that we perceive the distance of travel to be different. Okay, we perceive the distance of travel to be different in terms of time. Well, what does it mean if the time for a clock tick is different by measured by somebody standing on Earth versus somebody riding in the cart? Well, if you're moving faster, time moves slower. I'm oh, sorry. And if you're moving slower, time moves faster. It's really confusing, isn't it? Now, what DJ said is right. It means that time passes at a different rate in that railroad car than it does for somebody standing on earth. And then the question is who's correct? And this is the really hard part. Whoever has the non-inertial reference rate. And the I didn't hear what you said. Depends on who you ask. Depends on who you ask, so that was a good answer. <laughs> They're both correct. That's where this is weird. You have different times, and they're both correct. But that's what relativity says. That's the essence of the warping of the space-time continuum. It's changing spaces and times. And so two different people can measure the same thing, both measure correctly, and have different results. Yeah. So we're probably going to talk about this, but how did they like experiment to know that this is like a very interesting, like a really good experiment, I guess. Okay, so how would they experiment? One of the early experiments is to take atomic clocks. You take two identical atomic clocks, and you make sure that they, I say identical, obviously nothing's identical. It's close to what you get. Make sure that they're calibrated so they keep the same time when they're sitting next to each other. Then put one in a military aircraft and have it travel at very high speeds around the Earth a few times and then bring them back together. If relativity is correct, and the clocks are really running at different rates, what are you going to see when they come back together? Different times. They did the experiment, and what did they measure? Different times. OK, I have two questions already queued up, and then DJ. Mira, then Michael, then DJ. Oh, oh you are? OK. So Mira, then DJ. So in astronomy, we talked about how things get warped significantly when things fall into black holes. Mm -hmm. This is the same concept. That is it. With astronomy, we're talking about general relativity, about a mass warping the space time continuum. Here, we're talking about speed. But it's this, they're both relativity. OK. DJ. So whenever I'm trying to understand these experiments and yes. stuff, um, I always get difficulty trying to figure out how exactly we're measuring time. Because, like, for instance, the second, mm -hmm. we just agree that, like, a certain amount of time is a second. Okay. And then, like, the, the, this is a good idea. I mean, there's a lot of mind bending things to think about. Like, one of those I had yesterday was, like, how do we know it's not just, like, the fact that you're moving fast, changing the physical mechanics of the clock itself? So, <clears throat> if we step back a minute, one of the fundamental Remember, there were basically two premises um, for our relativity at this point. And one is that the speed of light and vacuum is the same in all reference frames. The second one is that the laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames. So if you put those together, what those fundamentally mean is there is no experiment you can do that differentiates one reference frame, one inertial reference frame, from another inertial reference frame. That is, if you are in a car traveling at half the speed of light, every single thing you do in there is going to be exactly what we had when we did it here in the lab. There's no experiment that you can do that's going to be different. Unless, of course, you look out the window and you say, oh, the Earth is flying by. 
But then you could just as easily say, I'm stationary, the Earth is moving, versus the Earth is moving, I'm stationary. So since everything works exactly the same, we define the speed of light, for instance, um, as a fixed number and the meter based on so many wavelengths of a specific light. So in whatever reference frame you are, you can do that. You have here's a meter, and you know, all of the things we do that we've talked about are calibration for everything. Um, calibration per second is based on radioactive decay. I think it's radioactive decay. Um, you can replicate those. And everything is going to follow the same rules as this equation. That includes your heart rate, heart rate your metabolism. So if you are in the cart with that, you know, it, it's moving at a relativistic speed, you're going to measure your heart rate to your standard, you know, 65 beats per minute. But somebody outside says, your clock is running really slow. And not only that, your pulse is really slow. Your heart's beating like once every hour. Right? So it's you, your heart's beating just like normal. You're not dying. You're dying less, actually. <laughs> To somebody else, you're just not aging. Okay, question. So, um, the textbook had mentioned that nothing can travel the speed of light. Mm -hmm. um, but how does light. It... Nothing with mass. Oh, yeah, yeah. But what I'm wondering is how does that fit in with the black holes? I don't know if it's because it's just a theory, but like light can't escape from there. So Right. That if, if you go with the, the Newton-based physics for a black hole, the black hole exists because the escape velocity, the speed something would have to have to escape is faster than the speed of light. And since that's impossible, light can't escape. Mm. If you go with the Einstein view of the black hole, the Einstein view of the black hole is you have so much mass that it warped the space-time continuum, so you have a bubble. So there's no pathway out. Something goes and it's just gonna go around circles and stuff, and there's no pathway out because of the warped space-time continuum. So there are two different views of the that same That would make thing. sense. I think so you had talked about it in astronomy, but now it actually kind of makes sense. Right. Yeah. I, I think what we should do is watch the movie Interstellar. <laughs> see if that no, that movie is full of potholes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. The, the movie just was... It, there have been a couple science movies recently that just really did not fit with me at all. And the thing is, Kip Thorne was like the science advisor for Interstellar. Kip Thorne is one of the most esteemed astrophysicists of our day. But, well, what, they, what he advised them on is what a black hole should look like. And so it, it won awards for a as realistic as possible view of a black hole. That, that was his involvement. And of course, things like the rate at which time travels. Been different. But then there were other things like you know the, the whole book that I we're not going to watch Interstellar. Bottom line, we're also not going to watch. Was it Gravity? Basically, a, a two actor movie. Uh, yeah. That, yeah. Okay. So some things about time dilation. We call this time dilation because time expands. And we have here some basic rules. The proper time is not the same as the correct time. The proper time is the specific reference to the time measured in the rest frame. So for our, for our Einstein's clock idea, the proper time is the time measured by the clock because that clock sees itself as resting. It doesn't see itself as moving, right? The clock is in this closed container and everything's stationary. So that clock is measured at the proper time. The person standing outside sees the clock is moving, and thus that is gonna be the dilated time. So being able to identify the proper time, which is the time in the rest frame of the clock, is an important piece. And moving clocks always run slow. So if I'm standing here and there's a clock moving, I'm gonna see that clock is running slow. Am I right? Sure. Sure, I'm right. For you. But yeah, for my reference frame, that's exactly it. Can I apply that to this upcoming test? <laughs> in your reference frame, you're my right. Reference frame, you I don't know if the med school is in the same <laughs> reference frame as you are, though. Yeah, I know. It might be. It might be. We're all correct. Yeah. <laughs> it's a nice theory. 
Okay. So time dilation is the effect of the time between ticks is dilating, getting longer. Now, <sighs> just move to, I, I've already talked about those things. Problem solving strategy. Ident identify two events that you're measuring the time between. And those are essentially the tick for your clock, right? Those are delta T. And then identify the reference frame in which the clock is at rest. So do I have that on the next one? No, it's back here. The clock being at rest means that the two events are occurring at the, at the same location for the clock. So the clock says this happens right here, and then this happens right here, and didn't move in between. It can get a little confusing, which is why I have a couple questions coming up on this. So identify the reference frame in which the clock is at rest, and then you can calculate the proper time in that frame, and then calculate gamma so that you can calculate the dilated time is equal to gamma times the proper time and probably put your characters in the proper order instead of writing middle one, last one, first one. We usually use speeds measured in either a fraction of C or that would be beta is equal to 0 0.13. You could use a speed in meter per second, but I almost always am gonna take that how many meters per second it is and convert it into what fraction of the speed of light it is. Now I'm going to introduce right here, if your speed is greater than 0.1 times the speed of light, then you definitely need to use relativistic corrections. Why? Well, let's, let's just do a quick calculation. How much error do you have if the point one C? That's a gamma, it looked too much like an eight. So if I wanna find my error, my error is gonna be gamma minus one times delta T zero, or my percent error will just be gamma minus one. So let's calculate gamma for V is equal to 0 0.1 C. You put zero C, that would be dumb. So if we do that, okay, 0.1c squared, 0.1c over c, the c's cancel. 0.1 squared is 0 0.01. 1 minus 0 0.01 is 0.99. Square root of 0.99, I better go to this calculator. Clear. 0.99. Square root of 0.99 is 0.994. And then one over that, which I'm sure, there it is, is 1.005. So 1.005 minus one is 0 0.005 or 0.5%. So if you're at one tenth the speed of light, then your, your error is 0.5%. And that's generally what we're gonna consider our threshold. Everybody good with that? Understand? If you're going slower than that, less than 0.5% error, we're just going to say, who cares? That's why relativity doesn't affect us in our daily lives. Because in our daily lives, your car is not going 10th the speed of light. You don't run that fast. Airplanes don't go that fast. What? For the method of car accident at the speed of light. If you want to think about it, Look up the books by Gam George Gamov. I think that's how he spells his name. That's Mr. Tompkins, blah, 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 blah. 
in these books, Gamow writes about what would happen if the speed of light was a pedestrian speed. So like you could ride your bicycle at three quarters the speed of light and how the world would look. It's, it's pretty interesting. And, and you can find it freely on the internet. Um, so that will help you to think about what life would be like if we had to worry about relativity. Uh, I think it's, the premise is the guy gets really bored and starts thinking about these things while he's in an interview or something like that. I forgot. Okay, so I have three questions for you. An astronaut leaves Earth in a spacecraft moving at 0.80 C with respect to. You always have to have with respect to. I went through and changed this slide, and then I went to a different version and forgot to rechange it. So 0.80 C with respect to the Earth and travels to a star 30 light years away. Who measures the proper time for the trip? Is it the astronaut, an observer on Earth, or neither or both? Assuming that they did it correctly, both. So, the astronaut. All right, we got one, one for each. Hey, well, we didn't get a neither. Now, let's work on our nomenclature. What does proper mean? Okay, it doesn't mean correct. It means the one in the reference frame where the clock is not moving, which is always going to be the shortest time possible for the trip. Um, so, so DJ changed the astronaut. Ryan. Uh, if they had a camera on the clock that was streaming to Houston, mm -hmm. uh, would they be seeing the right time? No. Now, there's two things to think about here as you say that. And this is where if you watch, if you watch, if you read the Ender's Game books and you go past the first one, I think the second one is Speaker for the Dead, it talks about traveling at near the speed of light and how time dilation allows Ender to travel for thousands of years but Ender is only aged a couple years. It's really good physics. Orson Scott Card has really done a good job with his physics there. Has some other interesting things like the Ansible, which to my best understanding, the Ansible is using the spooky interaction between um, particles, like if you have pair production, produce a, a positron and an electron together, that they're tied together. So if you manipulate this one, this one here is gonna be manipulated somehow. And so that's how they communicate at any distance instantly. It's very good in understanding of physics now that we're to that point. So, so I strongly recommend it. But over the weekend, you start reading Ender's Game, which is probably one of the best. How many people watch the, the movie? Okay. Oh, well, most of us. The movie I thought was great, but the book is it's really good. My, and the way my sister described it, this is what life would be like if we were super geniuses. And we thought it was awesome. Um, so you read that book, and it's actually going to help you think about topics relevant to what we're studying right now. Okay, so back to this. We had multiple answers. Let's get down to the guts of it. What we have to do following my strategy I gave you is identify the rest frame, which was the frame in which the two events occur at the same location, and the clock is stationary with respect to that. So what are the two events involved here? Spacecraft leaving Earth. Spacecraft leaving Earth, number one. Moving towards the sun. The what? Moving towards the sun. Okay, so what's the second event then? Moving toward is a continuum. Second event is when it... Reaches. reaches the star. So on our Earth frame, are those the same location? Nope. So that rules out our clock on Earth because the two events aren't the same location. In the rocket, are those the same location? Yeah, because you're in the rocket. Yeah, because it's right here in both cases. Now I'm on Earth, that's event one. Now I'm at... Does this say star, by the way? <laughs> star. 
Well, it doesn't land on the star. <laughs> now I'm at the star. It's right here, both in the same location. And the clock stayed stationary in that reference frame. So the, the astronaut who is at rest with respect to the rocket is going to be the one who measures the proper time for the trip. Now it's time for us to practice. You are going to have homework over the weekend. I'll probably actually make it due on Wednesday because I'm going to review on Monday. Um, but you are going to have homework nonetheless. So how do I find either of these two times? Which one's the one I can find right off the bat? It's not the astronaut's time. I can find the Earth's time. I can find the Earth's time because, and, and my problem, I swear I quoted this from the textbook or from a textbook, but it's not stated well. It should have been a star 30 light years away as measured from Earth. The speed of 0 0.80 C is as measured from Earth, and the distance of 30 light years is measured from Earth. That's why the Earth can make it, because we have the measurement of distance and the measurement of speed both from Earth's reference frame. And so we'll find the time on Earth. So delta time on Earth is equal to the distance measured on Earth divided by the speed. I didn't put a subscript Earth here. I didn't put a subscript Earth because as we talked about in class on Wednesday, the astronaut sees himself as stationary or herself as stationary and sees that star moving toward him or her at 0 0.80 C or the Earth moving away at 0 0.80 C. Whereas the person on Earth sees the same speed in the opposite direction for the astronaut. So that's why I don't need to specify the reference frame, I'm just putting the magnitude of the speed here. And so if we put in our values, the distance is 30 light years over the speed, 0 0.80 times the speed of light. What is a light year? All people who learn light year from Star Wars, you don't need to raise your hand. <laughs> It's the uh, amount of space that time or that light travels in a year. Yes. A light year is the distance that light travels in one year. Um, actually, the Star Wars one, it screws up the parts. I know. Yeah. Not light year. So I got that one wrong. So one light year is equal to one year. That's a year. One year multiplied by the speed of light. That's the definition of a light year. So I'm not going to convert that into meters. I'm just going to put that this is equal to 30 years times the speed of light. Right? 30 years times the speed of light is, a, is 30 light years. And actually it's 30.0. Somebody should have corrected me on my bad physics there. Got to keep the sig fig straight divided by 0 0.80 C. Well, my answer is still only going to have two sig figs, but you, know, you should keep it all. But now look, my C's cancel, and I just have 30 divided by 0.8. I know I should be able to do that in my head, but it's like 3 and what is it? Is it 3 quarters? 37.5. Three and three quarters and then multiply by 10. <laughs> so it's going to take 37.5 years as measured on Earth. Now, we've determined that the Earth is not measuring the proper time. They're measuring dilated time. So what does that tell us about the time it's going to take in the rocket? It's less. It's less. Of course, we want to calculate what it actually is. So delta T Earth is equal to delta T rocket. Remember, delta T rocket was the proper time multiplied by gamma. So that means delta T rocket is equal to delta T Earth divided by gamma. What's gamma? It's that equation.
Now I chose this gamma because it's easy. What's 0 0.8 squared? 0.64. What's one minus 0.64? It's, well, 1 minus 0.64 is 0.36, and then the square root of 0.36 is 0.6, which I think is where you were going there. So that means gamma is equal to 1 over 0.6. So that's what we can do in our heads. Usually you got to whip out the calculator, right? But when you can do it in your head, it's good form. So the time measured by the rocket is going to be 37.5. That's a 5. years multiplied by 0.6. It's divided by 1 over 0.6, which is multiplied by 0.6. So I just take that multiplied by 0.6, and I have 22.5 years. Who? Okay, Leslie. So I noticed you used two different equations for them. So, well, like, at least for the top one, you measured with a different equation. Okay. Be, be specific for me, because I don't think I did. You got, you did the delta T over DE over V, and then down there you did the delta T is equal to delta R. Okay. Gamut. Now I understand. Yeah. <laughs> one was the equation to find time based on speed and distance. One was the equation to relate time in one reference frame to another reference frame. Okay. So the lower one was the relativity calculation. Yeah. The upper one was just how we relate speed, time, and distance in a single reference frame. So it's like a conversion equation, essentially. Yes, it's converted from one reference to another, essentially. It's exactly. But it's a lot harder than converting units, right? Yeah. Now, I got 22.5 years to travel a distance that light takes 30 years to travel. That seems a little wrong, doesn't it? Well, here's the thing. Who measures the 30 years for light to make that distance, or that, that trip? People on Earth. Person who's paid in the lab. Person who's paid in the lab. For the people okay. in the spaceship, it's still going to take 30 years? No. For the person in the spaceship, they only age 22 and a half years. Wait. Oh, 22 and a half Earth years. Right. But the actual time spent is still 30 years? Or, the, or just, a person on Earth is going to age 37 and a half years. A person in, this, in the okay. spacecraft ages 22 and a half years. Don't worry, we're going to come around on this. We're going to come around on this. Right. Yeah, yeah, we are. <laughs> so, if you were to talk about that light, how much time travels for light when it makes this trip? We're still going to have delta T, Earth is 30 years. If we want to calculate for light, the light would be measuring its own proper time. And so we would use the same form, the delta time for light is equal to delta time, Earth, divided by gamma. What's gamma for light? The speed of light is speed of light. Yeah. So makes gamma infinity. infinity and for just dividing by infinity, Zero. No time passes for that light. It takes the light in its reference frame no time. The light in, okay, now I'm going to get crazy on you. <laughs> My personal theory about religion and God. God has three superpowers, if you will. He's omniscient, that means he knows everything. He's omnipotent, he has all power, and he's omnipresent, he's everywhere. If God were to travel at the speed of light, he wouldn't be everywhere. Now, my actual theory is that God created our universe with its laws of physics. And God is not part of our universe, he's outside of it. And time is just one of our four dimensions. Remember, for physics, we had x position, y position, z position, and time. Four things necessary to specify an event. Well, God's outside of our universe. To him, time is just another dimension. So the entire history of Earth is kind of like a book. 
And with the book, you don't have to start the first page and read sequentially. You can turn to the 27th chapter and, and you know, read whatever. So I think that we can explain God's omniscience to omnipresence by the fact that he's outside of our realm. He can see beginning to end all at once. That's my personal view. Okay, so getting back to physics, just had to throw that in there. It's been probably 25 years ago now that one of our Semtiansis institutions actually won a lawsuit saying that their education was not pervasively sectarian. That is that their classes that were not taught by the religion division had no religion in them, that there was no difference in them than if you'd gone to public school. I like to make sure that my class is pervasively sectarian, that you do have religious topics in it. So I always try to make sure I mention a few things like this to, to keep it sectarian. Even if there are some Seventh-day Adventists who would probably find fault with my belief. <sighs> Keeping on with this, how is it possible for the person to travel 30 light years at the speed of 0.8 C in only 22 and a half years. How is it possible? Yeah. yeah. I mean, if we're going to calculate the distance they traveled, how would we calculate the distance they traveled? Well, well isn't it based on the angles of our eye? Let's go back to this right here. Distance, time, and velocity. Right? We have the distance they travel must be equal to the speed multiplied by the time. Which I'm going to put in my equation for time here. The speed multiplied by the time on Earth divided by gamma but speed multiplied by time on Earth, that's the distance traveled on Earth. So it's going to be the distance on Earth divided by gamma. So the distance the person in the rocket travels isn't 30 light years. Does that make sense? Mathematically. Mathematically. <laughs> Cognitively, it's really confusing. That's, again, when we talk about warping the space-time continuum, the time changed and the distance changed. You can give up a little distance for time or vice versa. And so the person here had a shorter time for the trip, and along with that, they determined that the trip was only... 30 light years divided by, again, 1 over 0.6. So that's going to be 6 times 3 is 18. So they said this it was only 30, or 18 light years. No big deal to spend 22 and a half years traveling 18 light years. How do we get 18? Um, I believe that 6 times 3 is 18. Yeah. No, no, I'm moving like from the, the stream. Like, how does that okay, that, that was just this calculation right here. Distance is speed uh, multiplied by time. So the speed multiplied by, and this here was the time equation from right here. But... V times time is the definition of distance. Since that was time Earth, that's the distance Earth on top. Mira. So how can it take no time at all for light to travel this point when it takes eight minutes from light to get to this from the sun to the Earth? I'm not getting this. Okay. Once again, it's who's making the measurement of time. For the light, it takes no time to get from the sun to Earth. But from the Earth perspective, it takes eight minutes for the light to get from the sun to the Earth. I, I always refer to our relativity section as a walk on the wild side because it requires you to think completely outside of what makes sense in our normal everyday lives. Yeah, it's hard to imagine what it would be like to be light and be 
What? Okay, so what again? Why is it a uh, no time for light to get to the earth? Because it's traveling at the speed of light. And so as far as the light is concerned, no time is ever going to pass unless it slows down. If it goes into plexiglass, it slows down, right? Because you have a mesh refraction that's not one. Then it has some time to pass. Yeah. So there was a question that was saying, like, um, if a spaceship was, like, traveling and there was, like, a lot of air or whatever, and then it shined the light, you know, what speed the light is going. And then it said less than speed of light because it wasn't in vacuum. It was in air or something like that. I, I was going to say, we usually do that in vacuum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you do it with air, then it yeah. makes it different. Yeah, I, I have missed that one because I was just thinking, oh, well, in a vacuum, you know, this, whatever. Yeah. And then I totally spaced about the fact that it showed, like, yeah, air. Yeah, so if it's going through something other than vacuum, then it's going a little bit slower, and then you have the differences. That, that's an unfortunate question, honestly, because it's just going to confuse the person who's just picking up the concepts. Yeah. Yeah, I got a lot of people. We all agree it's an unfortunate question. Yeah, there's a lot of unfortunate questions. Four, four feet. Four feet. <laughs> okay, this question should look somewhat similar. A sprinter, let's say it's Usain Bolt, runs a straight 100 meter race. Who measures the proper time for this race? Usain Bolt does. Okay, you guys were right on top of that. Why are you correct? Yeah. That the time is at rest and it's at both the beginning and it's, now you have to keep in mind this question presupposes that he runs a constant speed throughout, but let's not worry about that. The, the clock is stationary throughout and the starting and ending points are the same place. So is the is the sprinter's personal stopwatch going to measure a longer or shorter time than the official time? Should the sprinter then be upset? Yes. <laughs> well, no, because the people who are judging are the ones that decide who wins. Because if we're really going to think about it, his time is different from the other runner's time. So how do you compare those two times if they each have their own time? But but the thing is, you're, you're, you're compared against the clock for world records, and you want to be recognized as... But the thing is, the sprinter is also going to be chuckling to himself and say... <laughs> That was only 99.99999 meters. That wasn't a full 100 meter because the length also was shorter for the sprinter than it was for the person on Earth. Uh, come on. <laughs> but, well, yes, <laughs> that's true, but it's not by any amount that's measurable to you and me because none of us are traveling at a tenth the speed of light or so. Okay, not so even Usain Bolt. As we move at higher speeds, the distance that we're like trying to get to becomes shorter. Yes. <laughs> okay, but not just because we're getting closer, but so because space time itself is warping. Yes, and that, that's, that's the argument that Star Trek's true believers make for the whole, he made the whatever run in so many parsecs. Oh, that's Star Wars. Oh, Star Wars, yes, yeah, Star Wars. Okay, you know, <laughs> the Millennium Falcon made some run in so many parsecs. Well, parsecs is a unit of distance, and everybody's all, ha, 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 they don't know, and of course, the honest person says, yeah, they didn't know. They just thought parsecs. It has second it for a second of arc. <laughs> the parsec is a parallax arc second. But people will argue and say, no, no, because of length contraction. It's actually this long, and he did it in only this distance, which meant that using length contraction, he was going at this speed. Right? The, the true believer can find a way. <laughs> All right. Now to the question Ryan really wanted to ask. An astronaut leaves Earth in a spacecraft, moving at 0 0.80 C relative to the Earth, travels to a star 30 light years away, and comes back. Who measures the proper time for this trip? It's more complicated, isn't it? Because the two events are the same location yeah. Yeah. in both frames. But in only one frame did the clock remain stationary. And that's in the rocket ship. So the person in the rocket ship measures the proper time. And now we get to the real thing that was bugging Ryan. 
how old, how much has the astronaut aged when they took this trip? So let's, let's write up here what the two numbers were. For the one way, we had delta time Earth was 37.5 years and delta time rocket was 22.5, wasn't it, years? So what's the age of the astronaut when the astronaut returns, or excuse me, not the age, how much is the astronaut aged? It'd be uh, twice the... Twice which number? Oh, well, his number. Okay, twice the 22.5. So 45 years have passed for the astronaut. How much time has passed on the Earth? Twice the Earth time. Twice the Earth time. So that's going to be 75 years. How does this make any sense? Is it possible? We call this the twin paradox. Because if you think about it real carefully, the twin on Earth was measuring the proper time for themselves, right? And as the rocket is flying out, the person in the rocket sees the twin as moving themselves as stationary. So they see the twin's heart going really slow, and the twin's not aging. And so we call this the twin paradox because when the rocket's moving away, the twin on Earth says, my twin's heart is beating really slow. They're not really aging much. And the twin of the rocket says, my twin on Earth's heart is beating really slow. They're not aging much. Right? Because both of them are going at constant speeds, inertial reference frame. But they can't both be right. right? They can't both say, I'm the younger one. Or I'm the older one, whichever. Yeah. yeah. At that point, then you want to be the young one. You want to be the young one. So the twin paradox is how is that? And it comes back to actually something I have. Is it both going away from each other? That they assume that it's. No, the direction doesn't matter. It is. It is going back to. Special relativity only applies in inertial reference frames. And so the calculation we're doing has to be done in a non-accelerating reference frame. If the, if the reference frame is accelerating, it's going to mess stuff up. So the person on Earth says my twin didn't age as much. They're going to be the one that's correct. The twin who is in the spacecraft, when they took off, they went from zero to, to 0.8 C. During that acceleration time, our calculation isn't correct. Mm -hmm. And so what they would have seen is during the acceleration, they're like, by the gods, my twin is aging like crazy. You know, he, since I'm talking about me, if I had a twin, which I don't. You know, my twin just aged 20 years while I was here aging one. Then they go at constant speed and they would say, wow, now my twin's aging really slowly, but it's still older than me. And then when the accelerates come back, they go through the same increased aging for the twin. And so it's during those acceleration periods that there's going to be a difference compared to what we do with our special relativity. So in a sense, the aging takes place in an instant from their perspective. Not in it. Well, if they instantaneously accelerate. Yeah. Yes. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what happens to you if you instantaneously accelerate? Your width becomes smaller and smaller. And I'm talking about your real width. Not just your, your crush your length shape. contracted width. Right? You'd be crushed. Nice. Right. Um, <laughs> that's why in all of your good sci-fi movies, you Not have much. inertial dampeners. What is inertia? It's the uh, characteristic of something to resist a change in, in motion. That's why you would be flattened during the acceleration. So the inertial dampeners, the sci-fi idea of inertial dampener is necessary if you're going to have super high speeds that are attained within a lifetime. Otherwise, you get crushed. And so the inertial dampener just yeah. makes it so inertia doesn't work. It negates Newton. You turn off Newton, and then you can just accelerate. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a little bit more disconcerting now when you watch sci-fi and they say the inertial dampeners, you... Okay, so that's just turning off Newton? Great. <laughs> All right.
This is actually the twin paradox problem that we've just gone through. 20 year old astronaut named Ashton. Actually, Ashton's four years old right now. If we're going to talk about my grandson, um, travels, you know, makes the trip. How old are they going to be? We've gone through this whole thing. We'll just do length contraction next Wednesday, I guess, because I'm going to review on Monday. But you have plenty of homework that you can do on time dilation.